Well, welcome to our weekly Zoom news conference. I'm Sandy Close, Director of Ethnic Media Services. We are honored to co-host today's briefing with the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Our topic is the struggle to safeguard voting rights, perhaps the most pressing civil rights issue of the moment. On Wednesday, Republicans used the filibuster to block debate over the John L. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Even as 19 Republican-led states have passed restrictive new voting laws. Our speakers will update all of us on the stakes, particularly for ethnic voters, and where the struggle goes from here, focusing still on the Senate, looking to the courts, reforming the filibuster. Our speakers include Wade Henderson, interim president and CEO of the Leadership Conference, Sean Morales Doyle, Acting Director for the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice, Jacqueline De Leon, Staff Attorney for the Native American Rights Fund, and John C. Yang, Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. Reporters, please enter your questions on the chat box and speakers, please speak slowly as I'm speaking for our interpreters who are simultaneously interpreting in Spanish, Mandarin and Korean. So with great pleasure and excitement, uh, I am introducing our first speaker, Wade Henderson, who also opened the doors of his office to ethnic media way back in 2007 when we moved to Washington. Don't think I ever forget. Okay, Mr. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. As Sandy said, I'm Wade Henderson, the interim president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights a coalition of more than 230 national organizations working to build an America as good as its ideals. Now, I wanna thank Sandy Close of Ethnic Media Services for coordinating this briefing. She is a longtime friend and colleague. We go back many years. I have such respect for her work and it's a great honor to be here. This is a very important discussion, more so than our usual convenings. Democracy is in peril. There are too many in this country who fail to recognize the urgency of the moment. That's why having a conversation about the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the Freedom to Vote Act is so critically important. Now with that, let me begin by acknowledging our deep disappointment in the Senate's failure this week to advance debate on the John Lewis bill, the legislation to restore and strengthen the Voting Rights Act of 1965. By the way, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the contributions of Jacqueline DeLeon of the Native American Rights Fund and Julie Kitka of the Alaska Federation of Natives, without whom we would not have had Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska as a co-sponsor of the effort to begin debate. It's just proof positive of the power of ethnic organizations in bringing about change in this area. It has now been eight years, four months, and 11 days since the Supreme Court gutted the heart of the Voting Rights Act in the Shelby County versus Holder decision. It was a blow to our democracy. 
and the decision unleashed a tidal wave of measures to restrict the vote that resemble the Jim Crow era, both in intent and intensity. That anti-voter assault has only grown in momentum since the 2020 election. The January 6th insurrection left us no doubt of the fragility of our democracy. And state legislatures are now hell bent on perpetuating Donald Trump's big lie. As our friends at the Brennan Center are tracking, and Sandy pointed out, between January and September of this year, 19 states have enacted 33 new laws that restrict our freedom to vote. Further, the Leadership Conference has published 13 state reports that document chapter and verse the pervasive and pernicious racial discrimination in voting. The evidence could not be clearer that the Senate action is necessary to restore the Voting Rights Act. Now, before now, voting rights has always had bipartisan support. We must never forget that Republicans voted, supported the 2006 reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act in a 98 to nothing vote. 13 current Republican senators voted for the reauthorization as members of Congress. Their unwillingness to support the legislation today demonstrates how hyperpartisanship has overtaken longstanding bipartisan support for voting rights. And in fact, when we need it more than ever. Now, it's as if the party of Lincoln has become the party of anxiety, fear, and resentment. This fight is about what's at stake for American values and American voters. Failure to recognize that is to deny the fundamental promise of our Constitution that every voice and every vote must count. Now the window is closing, but there is still time to act. We will be pressing each and every day to protect our democracy with the passage of these bills. In fact, Congress should even cancel the recess next week. The lawmakers shouldn't go home as these voting rights bills languish. Time and again, Voters have shown up for democracy. Now, senators must show up for voters before it's too late. I'm looking forward to hearing from our panelists because as I said earlier, democracy is facing challenges unlike any we have seen in modern time. So thank you so much for being here this afternoon. And Sandy, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Let us go to our questions in the chat. We begin with Henrietta Burroughs from East Palo Alto today. Henrietta, would you ask your question? Thanks so much, Sandy. Mr. Henderson, you talked about the law that got it, the Voting Rights Act. Could you say more about it and say precisely what this, the, uh, disastrous effect that this law had? Thank you for the question. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 essentially guaranteed or helped to guarantee the right to vote for individuals living primarily in the old Confederacy, the old South, the 13 states that had been involved in a history of segregation and discrimination. It had been found prior to 1965 that in those states, the 14th and 15th Amendment to the Constitution, which guaranteed the right to vote for everyone, had not been enforced for a variety of reasons, including large voter suppression efforts. So in 1965, Congress created a system that involved a pre-clearance provision that the Department of Justice applied to changes in voting in those states because of their history of discrimination. Those protections were known as Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. But in the states where Section 5 or clearance applied, 
there was a formula that was used to determine which states would be covered. That formula had been based on a history of discrimination in those states prior to the adoption of the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Well, in 2013, the Supreme Court ruled that the formula that had been used to determine which states would be covered by the preclearance provisions was outdated and needed to be reformed. So they struck the formula down as being in violation of the state's rights to sovereignty. And that cancellation of the formula crippled the preclearance provisions of the Voting Rights Act, such that they were largely inoperative. There was another provision of the act known as Section 2 that allowed individuals to bring lawsuits, that is not the federal government, because it was the federal government, the Department of Justice, that exercised jurisdiction over preclearance. But Section 2 allowed civil rights groups, like many on this phone today, to bring suits challenging practices in states around the country. It didn't have to be limited to the 13 jurisdictions that had been covered. But that case also, uh, rather that provision of the act was also compromised just this past summer in a case called Brnovich versus the Arizona Democratic Party. And so you now have in effect a Voting Rights Act in name only, one that doesn't really protect anyone. And because that formula was stricken, Section 5, the most crucial provision of the act, is null and void or inoperative. The court said that Congress could adopt a new formula based on current conditions if they examine those conditions effectively. And so organizations like those on the phone and many others, Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, a host of others, the ACLU, did research to demonstrate that this new, or rather this preclearance regime was absolutely necessary. The 13 reports that I referred to in my remarks, that by the way, are up on the Leadership Conference website, document in great detail what's going on at individual states that constitute continuing discrimination. And what we saw, by the way, in the immediate aftermath of the 2013 Supreme Court decision was a rush by states to enact new restrictions that made it harder for people to vote. In North Carolina, the Court of Appeals there said, look, this is like targeting the black community with surg almost surgical precision. So the whole point of, of my response is this. We have an ability to update the John Lewis bill, but we can't do it if Republicans take the view that nothing is necessary. We don't need to do this. And that's a false assertion and one that needs to be challenged in a very direct and frontal way. I hope that helps. Yeah, very helpful. Um, I'm gonna, we have other questions, but I'm gonna move in the interest of time to our next speaker and circle back for the questions for you, uh, Mr. Henderson. So our next speaker is Sean Morales Doyle, Acting Director for the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. Mr. Morales Doyle, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. As um, Sandy said, my name is Sean Morales Doyle. I'm the Acting Director of the Voting Rights and Elections Program here at the Brennan Center. And um, just to give a quick background on who we are, the Brennan Center for Justice. Uh, we are affiliated with the New York University School of Law. We are a um, law and policy institute dedicated to uh, protecting, improving, and defending our systems of democracy and justice. We do that uh, through a variety of means. Um, and I focus specifically, and my team focuses specifically on voting rights and elections. Um, and thank you. Uh, Sandy for inviting me and inviting us to participate in this and, and thank you to Wade for uh, opening the conversation, um, saying many of the things I was going to say. So I'm gonna do my best not to just uh, repeat everything that Wade has already told us, but um, he is of course right that we are at a critical moment right now for our democracy. Um, we are facing 
unprecedented attacks on our democracy. I think we, we all saw that come um, to fruition in a way that was frightening on, on January 6th of this year. We saw you know, real attacks uh, and attempted insurrection. We saw the threat that our democracy faces manifest in a way that I don't know that any of us thought we would. Um, that attempted insurrection was motivated by the big lie, by this idea that our elections were rigged, that there was rampant misconduct. Um, that same lie has fueled this wave of restrictive laws that Wade spoke about, that um, that same lie is what is being used to justify these restrictive laws. It's not the same um, in your face, visceral kind of attack that we all witnessed on January 6th, but it is an attack on our democracy and an attack on voting rights. Um, as Wade said, we keep track of every piece of legislation affecting voting rights introduced in every state legislation across the country. And this year we have already seen 19 states enact 33 laws that restrict access to voting. That includes a number of laws in places like Florida, Georgia, Texas, and Iowa that we, we refer to as monster voter suppression bills, these omnibus bills that contain a whole uh, array of restrictions on the right to vote. We are now also seeing in, in this redistricting cycle, we're seeing states introduce maps that will um, dilute and weaken the power of communities of color at the ballot box. And we are seeing the gap in um, turnout between voters of color and white voters uh, expand. Uh, it, it is expanding rapidly. In some states, it is at its highest level in a quarter century. Um, and so the, the impacts of all these things are, are very real. Um, that's even as we saw you know, record turnout in 2020. We did. We saw record turnout because of the political reality that we're living in. But that record turnout did not change the fact that there is this large gap and growing gap between white voters and voters of color in terms of turnout. All of this that we're witnessing, as we noted, we are facing this wave and facing this, these attacks with fewer tools available to us to fight them than we had in the past. That is because of the Shelby County versus Holder decision that weakened the Voting Rights Act in 2013. We have seen, we saw, we are seeing an unprecedented wave of restrictive laws this year, but we have seen laws um, introduced now for the last decade, making it harder to vote across the country in many, many states. This is not a new trend, it has just reached new levels and new heights this year. Uh, and, and then we can, the Voting Rights Act was weakened again by the Brnovich versus DNC decision in July of this year, which took away, or it didn't take away, weakened, blunted one of the tools that we as advocates have to challenge laws that are no longer stopped by preclearance as a result of the Shelby County decision. Uh, we have federal courts that are frankly oftentimes not friendly to the, the cause that we represent, the fight for voting rights and for voting rights for people of color. Um, it's not just those two big decisions. There are many other court decisions that have made clear that in many ways, the federal courts are not going to be a good place for us to wage this battle. Um, we will still continue to do that. The Brennan Center is currently suing the state of Texas over the bill that I mentioned just a little while ago. We still have tools available to us, but we have fewer than we once did right as we are facing these unprecedented attacks. And so that's why I say we're at a critical moment. Um, and the question is what will be done at this critical moment? And that's why all eyes are on Congress and all eyes are on the Senate because we actually do have two pieces of legislation that would help us get past this moment, that would take us in the right direction, that would give us the tools necessary to fight back against these restrictive laws and the attacks on voting rights. Those are the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. And the Freedom to Vote Act would set a floor for federal elections across the country. It would take so many of the things, the tactics that are used in states to make it harder for folks to vote off the table by saying you have to have a certain amount of early voting. You have to have same day registration. You have to restore voting rights to people immediately upon their release from prison. You have to 
have automatic voter registration. You have to do all these things that are, should just be the bare minimum in a 21st century democracy. And that would get us a long way towards pushing back against all of these restrictions, but it wouldn't get us all the way. And that is because the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965 with these preclearance provisions in place because Congress and the president recognized in 1965 the ingenuity of discrimination in this country, that when you cut off one option for discriminating against voters of color, states and other jurisdictions find another way to do it. We are witnessing that ingenuity in these laws right now. These states are finding new and different ways of accomplishing the objective of making it harder for some folks to vote. And without restoring the Voting Rights Act to its full strength by passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, we won't be unable to respond to that ingenuity. We'll take all the, the known ways of doing this off the table with the Freedom to Vote Act, but we still need the strength of the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and of the Voting Rights, rights Act of 1965 to really combat the efforts that we see right now uh, to attack voting rights. So we have questions for you, Mr. Doyle. Let's start with Peter White from the Tennessee Tribune. Peter, do you wanna ask your question? Hi, yeah, today there's supposed to be a vote on Biden's two big bills that he's asking everybody to vote for, at least all the Democrats. But I don't think the two voting bills are up for a vote today. So my question is, what should we expect from politicians in Washington regarding getting those two voting bills you know, to a vote? Um, sorry, it sounded like maybe someone else was. Uh, no, go ahead. Um, I think, you know, Congress prioritized these two bills by calling them Senate Bill 1, it's S1, HR1, S4, HR4. They made very clear these were priorities. And in some respect, they've treated them as priorities. Um, but they, they need to continue to make them priorities and get them across the finish line. What we saw earlier this week was, uh, a, was a vote on cloture on the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Um, and we saw the same on the Freedom to Vote Act just a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was, as Wade said, incredibly disappointing to see those votes fail and to see uh, one party refuse to even open debate on these incredibly important bills. Um, I think that we had to see that failure um, in order to make abundantly clear what is going to be necessary to get these things across the finish line. Um, and now it is incumbent on the Senate to take whatever um, action they need to take to make sure that they can get votes on these bills and get them across the finish line. It is unacceptable that there are these two bills that we need and we need not right now not even being debated because the minority party opposes them. Um, they have the support of a majority of both houses of Congress. And so the Senate needs to take what action they um, is necessary in order to get them passed. We have a question from Sunita Sarabji. Sunita, this question could go to either Mr. Henderson or Mr. Doyle. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I, I'd like to ask my question of both speakers. Um, what are some of the most insidious um, attempts that you've seen by states to restrict uh, uh, rights, especially for people of color? In other words, you want specific examples. Yeah. Of so I'll give one example, Sunita, yeah. and my colleague Sean is really the litigator of the two of us, and I think he has many examples, but I'll give one. You know, when the Supreme Court came down with its decision in 2013, I mentioned that a number of states jumped to make changes in its voting laws. So let's take one city in Texas, Pasadena, Texas. Pasadena, Texas is a small town. It's a growing town. It's got an expanding Latino population. If you look at the demographics of the 2010 census and the projections of the future, if you look at what happened in 2020, you'll see that the Latino vote 
in Texas has grown significantly, and if left to its own devices, would reshape politics in the state if you used fair procedures to determine one person, one vote. But in Pasadena, after the Supreme Court handed down its decision, the mayor decided to change the city government. Pasadena had eight city council seats, a city divided into eight city council seats. And the city government decided to change that to reduce the number of city council wards to six and to create two at-large seats based on voter registration and patterns of behavior. Those two uh, at-large seats would likely be uh, kept into majority uh, Anglo hands. Uh, the districts that were created were going to be packed with Latino voters in ways that would have limited the ability of Latinos to have fair, to have fair representation. Now, when the pre-clearance provision had existed of the Voting Rights Act, that would not have been possible. But with pre-clearance gone, the city could implement the change. The only way to stop it was lawsuits under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, and other groups brought on behalf of the Latino citizenry in Pasadena. They succeeded in beating it back because it was a violation of the 14th and 15th Amendments of the Constitution. And Section 2 permitted that to go forward, but at considerable expense. Previously, the federal government would borne the cost of that. This case had to be borne by the organizations who brought the litigation. That's an extreme, extraordinary expense. And even though uh, they succeeded in protecting the voting rights of the Latino population, it was in spite of, not because of, the Supreme Court's decision. And it's only by changing those uh, laws back to where they were that we hope to protect minority voters in places where you're seeing expansion based on demographic change. Sean? Thank you. Yeah. Sean, go That's ahead. I, I was also just hoping to add to Sumita's question, how many more states are likely to pass restrictive voting laws? Uh, you've counted 19. What are we looking at? Um, it may be that we stay at 19. It's hard to say for sure. But the fact is that most states legislative sessions for this year have come to an end. States can have special sessions and some of them do. So I, I, I don't know exactly what the number will be. But most of the le state legislative action has come to an end for this year. But I should also say, um, that's just this year. So again, this is uh, one year on the heels of 10, where we've seen lots of legislative action to restrict voting access. And we have every expectation that this trend will continue unless Congress does something to stop it. Um, I, I think Wade gave an excellent example that really, um, you know, shows how these things work in practice. I think there are, there are many more examples. There's, you know, some of the examples we frequently cite, as we had said, there, there was this immediate response to Shelby County. Uh, the state of Texas had a, a voter ID law that they had actually passed prior to the Shelby County decision, but it had been blocked during the preclearance process. And the, the day that the Shelby County decision came down within hours, then I think the next day, Texas said, we're going to put that voter ID law into effect. And that voter ID law you know, famously allowed for um, a, a permit to carry a weapon as a form of ID that you could use to show at the polls to vote, but not a student ID at the University of Texas. Um, and the impact was clearly discriminatory, and that's why it had been blocked by the preclearance provisions. And Texas immediately enacted to put it into effect. And then the Brennan Center and, and many other organizations sued to stop that. It took years of litigation and millions of dollars worth of legal fees on both sides of the case to. Um, to stop that law. Um, it was stopped. And then the, the state of Texas immediately passed a new piece of voter ID legislation that shifted things slightly in order to avoid um, losing in court, but was still a very restrictive law. Wade already mentioned uh, of one of these monster bills in North Carolina, which the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals said targeted African-American voters with surgical precision. Um, and it contained a, a variety of provisions that were intended to do that. Um, there are so many more examples and, and 
I, I could offer more specific examples, but I also want to say, you know, the, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act has this formula um, that we've mentioned that replaces the formula that the, the, the Supreme Court struck down in 2013. And the way that formula works is it says, um, we're going to look back 25 years and we're going to count how many times each state has violated the law against race discrimination in voting. And if that state has 10 violations and one of them is statewide, or that state has 15 violations within its borders, it will be covered by preclearance moving forward. So that's a high threshold, right? A state has to have violated the law 15 times in order to be covered, um, or 10 times if there are statewide violations involved. And there are gonna be a number of states that meet those requirements. There are states with dozens of violations. Um, a historian, uh, Peyton McCrary testified before Congress, counting up the violations state by state. Um, and in just eight states that were likely to be covered under the 2019 version of this, uh, this coverage formula, there were 143 violations in those eight states in the last 15 years. Um, th this is not like there's just an off case of discrimination here or there. These, these are states that are repeatedly and consistently engaged in these violations, which is exactly why the preclearance um, provisions are so necessary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Both of you. Um, let's go to our third speaker now, Jacqueline De Leon, staff attorney for the Native American Rights Fund. Ms. De Leon, thank you so much. It's now your, your platform. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you all today. And thank you to Wade and Sean who have set the stage so well. And uh, I, I've been editing my remarks and remarks to all into in response to to your well well prepared remarks. Um, but my name is uh, Jacqueline DeLeon, as mentioned, and I'm a member of the Asleta Pueblo and a staff attorney for the Native American Rights Fund, known as NARF. Uh, NARF is the nation's largest and oldest nonprofit law firm dedicated to advancing the rights of Native Americans. We've been defending voting rights of Native Americans for the past 50 years. Um, I want to start by setting the stage a bit and highlight a few of what I think are underreported stories about the abysmal state of voting rights in Indian country. Um, it is unreasonably difficult to vote across reservations in the United States. Often there are no on reservation polling places to cast a ballot in person. At times, natives have to travel over 100 miles over dirt roads. Natives are impoverished and lack access to working vehicles. And in Montana, following a Section 2 lawsuit to force on reservation voting that was resolved not long ago in 2014, turnout increased from an appalling 30% to 70%. Uh, natives vote if they're provided a fair opportunity, but they are too often not given that fair chance. Furthermore, the homes on Native American reservations are unaddressed. They do not receive residential mail delivery and post offices are also distant with poorer quality service than in urban areas. This makes registering to vote, being placed in the correct precinct and voting by mail difficult and at times impossible. It is a state that is shocking to most Americans. Um, what's even more shocking is the overt racism that is continuing to be faced by Native Americans when they try to vote. There is a big problem with racism in the border towns that Native Americans have to travel to because they do not have on-reservation polling places. This past year, the weekend before election day, a man in Glasgow, the border town of the Fort Peck reservation, won the local costume contest fully dressed as a Ku Klux Klan member. But it's not just the border town residents. Uh, election officials are actively discriminating against Native Americans. In Utah in 2018, a county clerk committed fraud to kick a native candidate off the ballot because a court had redrawn the county commissioner district the native candidate was running for that had previously been gerrymandered. And that clerk feared the native candidate would win. In South Dakota, county officials demean Native Americans by setting up a chicken coop as a polling place for Native Americans. And in Montana, this past legislative session, the state passed a ballot collection ban after we had successfully challenged that ballot, another ballot collection ban that was found unconstitutional because of the barriers it placed on Native Americans. 
The Montana Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights found this to be intentional discrimination. Uh, Montana has also, in the same legislative session, gotten rid of same-day voter registration. So the simple fact is we desperately need federal protections and voting rights reform in Indian country. We need uh, that historical federal protections, the same uh, urgency as 1965, um, to protect us from state and counties that discriminate actively against Native Americans. And to get there, we need our stories told. Uh, so we think that we have compelling stories um, that should be lifted up. Um, and I think uh, elevating, uh, you know, I think with regard to actually getting voting reform passed, um, we have to note, uh, as Sean did, that not all the bills being brought are the same. As uh, Sean explained, the Freedom to Vote Act provides prescriptive federal fixes for common ways that states disenfranchise largely minority voters. And these are critically important laws that must be passed to fight ongoing voter suppression. The John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, also known as the VRA, which has the Native American Voting Rights Act known as NAVRA attached, updates the Voting Rights Act, which is, and this effort has historically been bipartisan. It also includes NAVRA, which is also bipartisan in both the House and now the Senate. Um, updating the Voting Rights Act simply provides voters unfairly disenfranchised recourse through the courts to vindicate their rights. It also keeps bad actors through Section 5 preclearance from passing laws without a check on their discriminatory effects. I will note that through Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, uh, which was blunted by the Bernafitch decision, Native litigants have been successful over 90% of the time. In short, the facts are so bad, we almost always win. The Supreme Court's uh, you know, gutting of Section 2 and Section 5 threatens Native Americans from being able to get that relief that they deserve. We need a fix. Um, NAVRA also provides much needed reform, such as requiring on-reservation polling places. Um, and it was an important piece uh, to get the attention of Senator Murkowski, who ultimately reconfirmed her commitment to updating the Voting Rights Act uh, through the VRA and also endorsed the attachment of NAVRA. Thank you, Wade, for acknowledging the role of Native Americans in securing the commitment of Senator Murkowski to support VRA reform. Senator Murkowski, as you all may remember, was elected when Native Alaskan voters learned how to spell her name in support of her write-in election in 2010. And they voted, uh, I will note, in pitch black dark, you know, in the snow, um, uh, traveling long distances to get to polling places. Um, those same voters now insisted that they protect that she protect their vote and were grateful to see that she listened. And I think Senator Murkowski's position and support from Native Alaskans proves the important point that voting rights can and should not be a partisan issue. As we move forward in this discussion, it's important to emphasize the shift in conversation around voting rights. Historically, a bill like the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act would have been uncontroversial. Um, but the big lie and the antagonism towards voting rights has shifted that conversation. Um, we need to get away from the framing that the voting rights is a democratic ask. NARF is strong, staunchly nonpartisan and voting rights are nonpartisan. The shift within one party opposing updating the Voting Rights Act is a departure from their previous position and should be framed as such. Um, we're facing an onslaught of new voting uh, restrictions in face of the big lie and we need um, voting rights reform to fight against this discrimination. And we also need our stories told. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. De Leon, what are the prospects that native voters could mobilize in Arizona vis-a-vis -vis the Senator uh, Sinema? So I think that that's a um, certainly uh, I think Senator Sinema has a responsibility to listen to her native voters. Um, they have uh, elected her, um, the native voter turnout was larger than her margin of victory, or excuse me, and the potential for native voters in Arizona in particular remains um, large. Uh, and that's because native voters in Arizona are actively being uh, suppressed right now. Um, just this past year, uh, election, a county official um, refused to place a early voting location on the Pasquayaki reservation. And they spent $180,000 uh, 
fighting against placement of that on-reservation polling place. The desire to disenfranchise Native Americans in places like Arizona, a purple state, is deeply entrenched. Um, and I think that Senator Cinema has a responsibility to acknowledge that, uh, you know, that this is a pressing civil rights issue of her time and in her state. Um, and that's a case that we, you know, think that Native Americans have been making to her and will continue to make to her. We have one question, time for one question for you, one more question from Frank Blanquette from FNX TV. Frank, can you ask your question? Greetings, Jacqueline. Thank you so much for being here. Um, uh, there are so many issues that, that may affect tribes in Alaska or tribes in um, Navajo Nation or in the Dakotas, but um, what is the most active age range for the Native American uh, voter and how do we raise the, the participation of less active voter age groups within Native American communities and other indigenous groups? Is it only by establishing or increasing on reservation polling places? So thanks so much. Um, I think, you know, the age range shifts relative to the community. So there are historically been um, uh, efforts to disenfranchise, especially old, older voters that are alive today that were told that they were ineligible to vote because they were Native American and that they were not mentally uh, competent to vote because of the federal tribal trust relationship. And those scars run deep. And so there are older Native Americans who do not vote uh, because they were told that the system was not for them and they have passed those stories on to the younger generation. There continues to be an apathy in the younger generation because of the structural failings uh, throughout Indian country and the non-responsiveness of elected officials. But there's also been a very inspiring movement among the youth uh, to get out the vote. And I will say that they have led the charge um, in a lot of communities uh, to increase voter turnout. Um, I think that the solutions in Indian country are both structural and also, um, uh, you know, I think important, um, uh, you know, to, to, to fight against discrimination. So the structural barriers are the fact that, you know, one, you know, there's, there's dirt roads and um, services such as polling places are unreasonably far and we need a federal mandate that NAVRA provides that says, hey, you have to provide a polling place on the, on the, on the reservation. Um, and you have to provide on reservation uh, registration opportunities. Um, so I think that that's a federal mandate that needs to happen. But we also need um, you know, the VRA to be restored so that we can sue when there is active discrimination um, by state um, officials. Um, and we also need you know, the Freedom to Vote Act so that um, states are, are prohibited from uh, tactics that we know discriminate against minority voters. Um, so it's really a, a, a lot of answers. Great, thank you. We go now to John C. Yang, Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. John, thank you for joining us. You're back again. It's always great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. And it's always great to be here and be among what I would consider friends now. Let me first also start by thanking the work of Jacqueline, Narf, and many of the Native American organizations for getting Senator Murkowski on the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. It really shows the power of what happens when communities come together. It shows that our voices do matter and that even when percentage-wise one might think that we are small, we can make a difference. So I commend that work. And yes, there are still fights to be had but we should also take a moment to celebrate the, the victories that we have. Uh, so I'm John Yang, I'm the Executive Director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. Our organization's mission is to advance the civil and human rights of Asian Americans and to promote a fair and equitable society for all. I think Wade and Sean did a wonderful job of explaining both the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. So let me spend a little bit of time talking about why it matters for the Asian American community. For the Asian American community, in some ways, you could think of us as the newest citizens in, in this country. If you go back to the 1960 census, we were only 0.5% of the American population. Now, after the 2020 census, we are 7% of the population. We are the fastest growing community here in the United States, growing by over 38% since the 2010 census. And that shows up in the polls and shows up in voter registration and on, on election day. So in 2020, we had an increase of over 20%, which was the largest increase of any group, 
with respect to voters showing up when compared to 2016. And certainly if you look at margins, and here I wanna be careful here, but certainly you know, our community did provide a margin of difference in both Georgia and Arizona. I, I wanna be careful because again here, I'm not trying to say that Asian Americans are trying to take the credit for those victories, because again, it's all of us working together to sort of suggest what is possible when we're trying to defend our, our communities. So what does the, all of this mean for the Asian American population when we're talking about voting rights? You know, while we've seen this increase in we have also seen significant barriers to our, our ability to vote. And here, let me emphasize a point that Jacqueline made, which is this is not a partisan issue for us. For us, it is about making sure that every citizen that has the right to vote has the opportunity to do so in the most efficient and effective manner. And notice I say right to vote and not privilege to vote. Because for those that are suggesting somehow this is Democrats trying to rig the system, that is absolutely not what we in the Asian American community are talking about. Our community is quite diverse. You know, we do have uh, uh, individuals of all different political stripes. But what we firmly believe in is that everyone's voice matters and making sure that they have that ability to uh, have their voice heard matters. And so that's why any attempt to suppress those votes makes a difference to our community. So we talked a little bit about these efforts and, and I want to pick up on something that I, I believe it was Sean that started talking about in terms of voter ID. Uh, so as examples of what this looks like in the Asian American community and as a very practical level, when you have a law such as voter ID that was proposed in Texas, what did that look like? When they were proposing that law, a Texas legislator said, that we think that Asian Americans should get more American sounding names so that it would be more easy to identify them. Well, what does that say about how that person views the Asian American identity to suggest that somehow our names are less American than other westernized names? Then if you talk about how that law gets applied, what you are looking at is, again, as an immigrant community, our community is over two thirds uh, immigrant, in other words, born in a different country, we know what our IDs look like. And frankly, they oftentimes look like a mess. You know, unless you have a, a Western surname, all of us as immigrants know that getting our names translated correctly onto a social security number, onto a passport, onto a driver's license, frankly, oftentimes are going to be inconsistent. And I'm not faulting in many ways those hardworking administrators at all of those offices. John, John, our interpreters are asking you to go a little more slowly. Sure, sorry about that. And I am not asking the, at the, I am not suggesting that the administrators at these offices are necessarily trying to do something devious. The reality is that yes, because these names sound foreign to them, they will sometimes have difficulty translating them in a consistent manner. And then when that comes to polling places, and people checking IDs, that results in people thinking that there is not an exact match. And certainly for those that choose to exclude voices of immigrant communities, they will use this as a basis to show that simply because there was uh, an A where on one ID, whereas there was an E on another ID, that that is insufficient of a match and prohibit that person from voting. So that is one example of how these laws uh, discriminate against Asian Americans. A, a second example would be, and this would apply to the Freedom to Vote Act, would be mail-in ballots. So in the 2020 election, in the run-up to it, in surveys done by our community, surveys showed that 64% of our community preferred voting by mail. And some of that might be understandable, because again, if there are limited English proficiencies involved, you might want a little bit of extra time, not want to feel the pressure of being at that ballot box and having a line waiting behind you, waiting to vote. So that having it at home, having the ability to translate materials and making sure you understand it in the comfort of your own home makes some sense. And this played out also in real life. In Georgia, 40% of the Asian American population voted by mail compared to only about 24% uh, or 26% of the general population overall. In the runoff election in Georgia, 
34% of the Asian American population voted by mail compared to 24% of the population overall. So for us, voting by mail matters. Voting by mail is a, is a means for which we can ensure that our voice matters and is counted. So these are not just simply theoretical questions to our community. These are not simply possibilities of discrimination. We, can, we have shown, we can show with data that this does indeed have a direct effect on our community. So the last thing I would say is perhaps where I began. It is about being having communities being able to exercise their voice. It is about communities not feeling that they are less of a citizen because of their immigrant status or because they have limited English proficiency or because they have different socioeconomic means that don't allow them to vote at, during a nine to five period. So for all of these reasons, you know, the Fro Freedom to Vote Act as well as the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act really matters to our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because of our questions in the chat, I think I'm going to ask each of our speakers to address one key question. And um, it has to do with what are our next steps? What are the most likely plans or strategies we can take given or if the Senate continues to stall, where do we go to get out of this, uh, as, as Wade says, this perilous moment? How do we redeem and safeguard voting rights? And we ask that as ethnic media reporters, whether it's a specific question for you, Wade, about your views on the filibuster, whether it's uh, the question we have on how do we educate people, this is a nonpartisan issue. So many of the questions we have are about not the value of the right to vote, but how do we safeguard it in the midst of this Senate opposition by Republicans? What, what do we, what are, what is the plan B? And maybe you could start, Mr. Henderson. Okay, well, thank you, Sam. It's a great question. Look, uh, let me say, colleagues, failure is not an option. I mean, you have heard from our colleagues, myself included, uh, discussing the threats that exist. State legislatures are enacting new restrictions every day. We're going to see lots of them by the end of the year. Redistricting is in place now, gerrymandered districts that will reduce the political effectiveness, particularly of communities of color and young, young people, et cetera. And uh, it's not gonna change, colleagues. I mean, it's about to intensify. Uh, so the political climate that helped produce this moment is actually like a hurricane building in strength in the coming weeks ahead. So my view is that the responsible parties in this matter are Republicans. They have voted for the bill in the past, 13 of them are in Congress today, but turn their backs on the voting rights bill. And we need to take the heat them. This is not a partisan conversation. I'm saying you confront the individuals who refuse to even debate the issue with the evidence of their uh, difficulty. So here's an example. Let's take Texas. John Cornyn was in Texas in 1996. He voted the Voting Rights Act. Two days ago, he voted against starting the debate under the assumption that nothing was wrong. Texas has enacted a voter restriction regime that the Department of Justice has now filed a lawsuit challenging. We have a well-documented report of voting violations throughout the state that we have listed as contemporary examples of the problem. I cited the city of Pasadena, Texas, that attempted to change the law in the immediate aftermath of the Shelby County decision. How much additional evidence is necessary that problems exist? And the fact Cornyn refuses to even support a debate on the issue is unconscionable. So he needs to be confronted with direct political heat from the constituents of his state, citizens who either voted for him or who didn't vote for him, but nonetheless are citizens of Texas. 
And at the very least, he should be uh, demanded, a, a meeting should be demanded. Now, in August, he had local groups in Texas right to request a meeting with Senator Cornyn. Thus far, he has refused. And that is unconscionable. He needs to be pressed. And the story needs to be taken to the press that argues he will not meet with his own citizens to discuss well-documented challenges to the right to vote. And by feeling that pressure, hopefully he and others will come to the table to at least start a conversation. But we should never forget, Sandy, that we who are the voters less, uh, possess the political power. The issue is, are we organized sufficiently well to use it in precise ways that help to move the system forward? And being strategic in how we target uh, our votes accordingly is really necessary. We're not helpless supplicants, and we shouldn't come to the table as if we're begging for a privilege. This is a right. We should demand it, and we should generate the political heat necessary to obtain it. I'll okay. stop there. For your strategy, John Yang, um, how are you advising? We have many AAPI media on the call. What is, what is your best advice for us in the media for advancing this effort in the face of such strong opposition and unwillingness to even debate the Voting Rights Act? I think Wade is right that you have to demand accountability from the elected officials. To go back to the question of how to make sure this doesn't become a partisan issue, part of it is talking about what the effect has been on the community of these restrictive voting policies and not even necessarily blame as to who is passing them, whether it's Republicans that are passing them, whether it is conservatives, but rather simply say, here are the policies that are being enacted that we are trying to fix. Uh, and here's what the impact has been on our community of those policies that have suppressed our vote, right? Then people start to understand that this is a problem. Uh, you know, I need to get into who caused it if that makes some people uncomfortable, but here's a clear way in which we can fix it. To go to very briefly to one other question about Republicans uh, know that voting is not partisan, but they would know that they would start losing. I actually would posit this. Is, is it guaranteed that they would lose elections simply because there are more voters? Perhaps the answer right now is yes, but perhaps that is because of the position that they are taking on particular issues. You know, it was not always the case that Democrats were for communities of color, right? It, there, there was a shift because of the shift in politics and how people looked at issues. And so in that sense, if people were to take a big picture, the big picture is we want a democracy where as many people participate. And then once these people participate, we have an argument. That's the beauty of democracy. We have an argument on the values, on the issues. And we try to persuade the voters that our policies make sense. Thank you. Mr. Morales Doyle, what is your sense of the way forward, how do we draw a line in the sand so we don't wind up not with 19 states, but 25 states? And if Congress isn't the way to draw the line in the sand, what is Brennan's perspective on strategic, how to, how to move this forward strategically? Um, so first of all, I want to second what Wade said, that failure, failure is not an option and, and the way forward is Congress and, and Congress needs to be told that over and over and over again and they need to hear that and understand it and act. Um, that said, we don't, we haven't stopped fighting these laws while we're waiting for Congress um, and we won't. Uh, Jacqueline gave a number of examples of, of Section 2 suits. Um, we, as I mentioned, we are currently suing the state of Texas over Senate Bill 1. Many of our colleagues and allies are suing other states over their restrictive bills. Um, just yesterday, the United States Department of Justice filed suit joining us in our fight against the Texas bill. Uh, the Department of Justice has also sued in Georgia. Um, we are going to use the tools that we have available to us to push back against these laws. Um, the fact is, that we need more. Um, so it's not, it, 
it's not as if the fight will stop while we're waiting for Congress, or if Congress fails to get its job done, that we will give up. We've been fighting this fight for, you know, we and our predecessors have been fighting this fight for decades and will continue to. Um, but this is a really critical moment. We are in a different place than we have been in the past. And so uh, the fact that we'll keep suing in court doesn't mean it's any less critical that Congress act. Uh, I will just also say, apart from suing, um, we need to keep up the the work to change the public narrative about this. I think we we have done a good job of getting the majority of the public on our side on this issue. Uh, that, that most people do want an an expansive democracy that welcomes everybody to the table. The, the kind of democracy that John just described, and most people these days, more than I think in my lifetime at least care about voting rights and make it one of their top political priorities than, than ever before. This is, this is the thing that voters care about. That's why Congress has prioritized these issues as the first bills that they introduce. They're responding to their constituents and they can see that their constituents care about this because they're also seeing the action in the states. And so we talk a lot about the, the 19 states that have passed 33 restrictive laws, but we've seen more states pass more expansive laws this year. And there, there are these divergent trends so there are many states in this country that are making voting more accessible, that are expanding our democracy because they are responding to what voters care about. And so it is equally important that we keep um, voters and the general public, you know, dismissing the big lie and focusing on an expansive democracy. And we'll continue to do that work as well. So none of the work stops while we're waiting for Congress to act, but we still need Congress to act. Great, great, great. Three great responses. And now we have our fourth from Jacqueline de Leon. You have the last word. I'm sorry, we're two minutes over time. So if you could keep it to two minutes, we would be very grateful. Thank you, Ms. de Leon. I'll, I'll keep it brief. I think, you know, my colleagues have certainly covered uh, most of the tactics. The only thing that I would reemphasize is making the case to the American people is critical here because you know that is the core of of you know bringing up this action, uh, bringing up collective action, and and I think you know that pressure comes from compelling narratives, um, and we have you know very compelling narratives in the Native American community of current present day voter discrimination um, and racist abuse, uh, and I think that. Um, you know, telling those stark stories, I think it sticks in my mind, you know, denying uh, Georgian uh, um, people water in line. Um, I think that that that, you know, outrage is um, visceral and important. And I think likewise, um, traveling 100 miles over a dirt road to a, a polling place is uh, viscerally um, uh, impactful. I think that you know being forced to vote out of a chicken coop with feathers on the floor is viscerally impactful, and uh, county clerks committing fraud is viscerally impactful. And I think that we need to elevate that story because this isn't a partisan power grab. This is about protecting American citizens from racist abuse, and uh, and you know denying them their right to participate in Americans' political system. And we um, have an obligation as the civil rights issue of our time uh, to protect American democracy. Thank you. Thank you to all four speakers for this very helpful seminar. It's a news briefing. It helps us keep this issue front and center in our audiences, in our coverage and for our audiences, but it also inspires us and helps inform how we report, how often we report, and how we report on this issue, as you put it, um, Ms. De Leon, the central civil rights issue of our time. Thank you very much, and thanks to our media for your attendance, as always. This conference is adjourned on behalf of the Leadership Conference and Ethnic Media Services. Goodbye, and thank you again.